Um, Roger is an Ashby Village member, as you probably know. Um, he's a volunteer. Many of you know him as a handyman. Um, he was a teacher at, of anthropology and human evolution at the uh, Peralta Community Colleges for 40 some years. And um, he is a well-traveled bird enthusiast. So he is currently, or was um, currently a um, docent at the California Academy of Sciences um, in San Francisco. It's on hold now that the coronavirus is causing problems, but I'm sure we'll pick it up. He'll pick it up as soon as it as possible. So that's it for me. Here you go, Roger. Thank you very much for agreeing to talk. Okay, so Roger, you are now unmuted. Can you hear me Oops. now, Audrey? Audrey, are you here? You hearing me? I can hear you. Okay. Rhoda, nod your head if you hear me. Yeah, okay, great. All right, so um, anyway, thank you very much and thank you everybody for joining us. Um, and uh, also wanted to thank um, uh, particularly Celia and Hillary who uh, helped with us to figure out how to use all this technology and um, they've been a wonderful resource. And I uh, particularly want to thank uh, Jerry Abrams, although he's not with us anymore. Um, Jerry was the founder of this group. And um, I thought one of his uh, big uh, contributions was that he gave us all permission to look into fields that we maybe weren't that knowledgeable about. And so uh, we were able to uh, branch out into a lot of different uh, subject areas and Jerry himself gave uh, presentations on lots of stuff and um, wasn't, you know, his field was uh, what, nuclear physics or something like that. So, uh, but anyway, it's just a way of excusing myself for uh, talking about a field which isn't really my main field, uh, but it is related. So um, as Audrey mentioned, um, I uh, am a retired anthropology teacher and uh, I just give you a little bit of background on this. Um, there's four major fields in anthropology. I started out in cultural anthropology, where you go and do field work. I did field work in South America. Um, it's about human cultures and societies. Um, archaeology, um, I didn't do a lot in archaeology, but I did teach it once or twice, and it has to do with prehistoric cultures. Uh, human evolution, which is really the relevant thing here. I, uh, taught human evolution for many years, including uh, fossil humans, uh, Neanderthals, uh, and uh, Australopithecus, and all that sort of thing. Uh, and primates, uh, the uh, non-human primates, apes, monkeys, uh, prosimians, um, lemurs, critters like that, and how they're related to us and how we evolved from the primate family. Uh, human genetics, so we're going to get into a teeny little bit of genetics here in this presentation. Uh, just a couple of basic concepts, um, but of course it's taken on way more significance than it had when I was in school. Uh, everything was was bones, you know, physical anthropology, we, we used to call it stones and bones. And um, now, of course, it's much more uh, genes than it is anything else. So. Um, that's been a real adventure, um, and I've been lucky to have a biochemist in the family. My wife, Audrey, has a doctorate in biochemistry, so she was able to help me uh, handle the genetic stuff. And then uh, human variation today, so-called human races and stuff like that. And then the fourth field is linguistic anthropology, which is something I'm very interested in. I love languages, and um, I did teach it a few times, uh, but we're not gonna get into anything about uh, linguistics today. But then the other side of it is the bird watching. And um, this is uh, me in uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, we did a field trip there uh, in January of this year, and we were so lucky to get it in before the shelter in place stuff happened. But uh, we just had a marvelous uh, trip there. Um, here's Audrey out. Uh, getting ready to look through the scope. 
Peter Kaysner, who's the man on the scope, is a world renowned birder. He's seen over 9,000 species of birds of the 10,000 some that exist. He's an amazing birder. Uh, and behind him, uh, Ashoka was our local guide. Uh, so uh, we were well taken care of and um, saw tons of birds. And I'll have a few of these uh, in the presentation today. Um, so uh, just a little bit about what is a bird. Now you might say, well, I already know what a bird is. Well, uh, that's true, but um, just some of what are the traits? What is it that distinguishes birds? Um, so, okay, uh, birds are vertebrates and uh, birds uh, have backbones. They, if you look at a bird skeleton, it's similar to our skeleton in a lot of ways. We're vertebrates, um, so um, that's one thing. Um, and birds have feathers and of course they're, they're unique in this regard and um, we think feathers are really important. Of course, um, nowadays feathers help birds because they're a lightweight uh, a feature that helps them to fly and weight is a big item, of course, if you're trying to fly. Um, birds don't have teeth. Uh, so that's an interesting thing. We're going to get into that a little bit about dinosaurs had teeth, most of them. And um, here birds don't. So how did that happen? So birds have beaks instead. Uh, beaks are one of the things about beaks, again, is they're very lightweight, uh, helps you to fly. Um, their wings are, their limbs are modified for flight. Uh, they have wings, birds lay eggs. Uh, birds are endothermic, they're warm blooded. Um, and birds have hollow bones and skeletons adapted for flight. So these are just some, we're gonna look at a little bit more, mostly about the feathers and the beaks and the wings. Those are the main things we're gonna look at here. But um, this is just a little graphic uh, presentation of what are, the vertebrates. And of course, uh, we're mammals are vertebrates, uh, the mammals on the right side, whales, humans, groundhogs, and then birds in the middle, and uh, reptiles, fishes, and amphibians. These are all different types of vertebrates. And you might say, well, okay, th that's pretty much everything, right? Well, if you actually add up all the different species of animals that there are in the world, uh, vertebrates, there's only about 70,000 of them, which is about 5% of all the known um, species of animals that, that have been described in science. So uh, vertebrates are important. We think they're pretty cool, and, but they're hardly the whole story. Um, now this is one of my favorite vertebrates, um, lilac breasted roller. Uh, this is a bird of uh, Southern Africa. And I would say if any one bird got Audrey and me into bird watching, this is probably it. And uh, if some of you may have been to uh, East Africa and you go on a safari or something and you probably remember these birds that they're absolutely beautiful, stunning, very interesting to watch because they perch and then they fly down and catch insects or, or lizards and things fly back up. So they're very visible, they're very conspicuous and they're incredibly beautiful. So um, we went to Africa back in the late eighties and we thought, oh, we just want to see mammals. We want to see giraffes. We want to see rhinos and so on. Um, well, what about birds? You know, I said, oh, nah, birds now. But uh, once you get a look at some of these birds in Africa, you go, well, you know what? There's a, there's a lot of fun stuff to look at. So that's our, probably our favorite bird. Um, here's the distribution of the lilac crested roller. Uh, we've seen them in South Africa and East Africa and various places, pretty widespread. Um, another bird that's uh, uh, one of our favorites, this is the rainbow lorikeet from Western, well this one is, we shot in Western Australia. It's actually introduced there. Um, it's native in Queensland, which is in the Northeast in the more uh, tropical area. Um, beautiful, beautiful bird. Um, they often flock uh, and um, there's places in Queensland where you can go and you can hold up a tray of, uh, of, of sugar water, basically. It's designed for them and they will come down and, and you can have 20 or 30 or 40 rainbow lorikeets perched on your head, perched on your shoulders, perched on your tray and lapping up this uh, nectar substitute, kind of like what we do with uh, hummingbirds. 
uh, they have this brush on their tongue that helps them to lap up uh, this uh, nectar source. So it's a parrot, you know, it's much more beautiful than lots of other parrots, but uh, again, a really interesting bird. Now the bee hummingbird, um, this is only known in Cuba. It's the smallest bird. So I think one of the things about birds is, well, how big do they get? How small do they get? Um, this is the smallest bird known today. It's uh, probably about half the size of the hummingbirds in your backyard. Um, it has a uh, very small nest, about an inch across, and uh, the, the uh, eggs are uh, the, the size of a coffee bean. So they will lay one or two eggs and, you know, like our hummingbirds, but anyway, a pretty special bird. Uh, he beats his wings 80 times per second. And if he's really excited and trying to woo uh, one of the females, he can get up to 200 beats per second. So pretty amazing bird. Um, and on the other end of the, of the spectrum, of course, we have ostriches. And uh, these are the, the biggest birds. Um, and they're flightless. They belong to a family called ratites. And what the ratites uh, are known for is that they don't have a keel which is this funny word for uh, a bone on the sternum, in the middle of the chest is the sternum. And uh, fl flying birds have a keel, which means that they have a piece of bone there that the flight muscles attach to, because the muscles can't do it alone. They have to pull on something. Now the, the ratites don't have it. And here's another example of a ratite. And this one's from Australia, cassowary. Um, it's almost as big, it's not quite as tall, but it's quite heavy. Um, they can get up to 130 pounds. Um, they can get five to six feet tall. Um, they can be pretty dangerous. Um, people have been killed by these birds. They have a middle toe, which is, has a sharp claw on it and just can rake, uh, split your belly open. So people treat them with respect. Although in New Guinea, uh, they, they live both in Australia and New Guinea, and uh, in New Guinea, the natives really like to catch them. It's a prestige item, and they eat them, although uh, reportedly the uh, flesh is very tough. And I was reading about the cassowary, and they have found this quote. Uh, an Australian officer who was stationed in New Guinea said that uh, if you're going to cook a cassowary, he said it should be cooked with a stone in the pot when the stone is ready to eat, so is the cassowary. So uh, that's uh, pretty tough. Um, another favorite bird, this is called a niceness taraco in South Africa. Very, very specialized, very limited in his range. Uh, so we see with evolution creating all these different varieties, you know, based on uh, uh, an early bird uh, starting uh, after the meteor strike of 66 million years ago, uh, quite a uh, huge variation. And here's the range of the niceness Turaco in South Africa because he lives in a coniferous forest and uh, there isn't much of it. You know, most of it, South Africa doesn't have a lot of temperate zone and it doesn't have a lot of temperate forest, but it does have a little bit. And uh, so that's the, the range and a pretty special bird. And just to, um, show you a bird that's not so specialized that it's limited. Uh, the osprey is uh, known on all continents except Antarctica. It's really quite amazing that, uh, that this bird has a distribution that's worldwide. Um, it's not, you know, it's, it, you can see it's certain swaths are not represented, it doesn't do well in deserts, for example. Uh, but uh, the one that, that picture was taken here in Western Australia. So uh, we were quite impressed with how this bird has an adaptation which uh, is almost worldwide. So there's a lot of variation here and it's really fun to study it. Um, this is a bird, the resplendent Quetzal, that some of you may have seen in uh, Guatemala or Southern Mexico or Panama, um, is one of the most uh, beautiful birds, very long tail feather. I throw him in there because of the sexual dimorphism. The males are very different from the females. And so 
uh, the males uh, compete for the females, of course, and uh, the one with the fanciest tail feathers and the nicest aerial display uh, is going to win the female and be able to um, send off uh, his uh, sperm and uh, reproduce. Now the Quetzal is pretty interesting. Here's his, here's his range in the Central America. Uh, but I threw in here a couple of his namesakes. Uh, on the left is uh, Quetzalcoatl, who was a, uh, a, a god in Mesoamerica, all the way back to the pre-classic, uh, around 100 BC, and all the way through. And he's, a, he's known as the plumed serpent. So Quetzal is plume and Coatl is serpent. And so he was a, the god of of learning, the god of the air, lots of different things, and a very important figure. And uh, on the right, uh, this is a reconstruction of Quetzalcoatlus, which is a, a fossil pterosaur. It's not a dinosaur, it's, an, it's a, a flying reptile of the Mesozoic, uh, and it's the largest animal that ever flew. And it's, you can see how big it is. It's pretty amazing that, uh, that that bird could get off the ground. And that people, uh, there's a lot of debates about the reconstruction and how heavy was it and so on. But as you can see, he didn't really have feathers. He just had this sort of a fuzz. And uh, there's also uh, ideas about, I'll get more into these uh, pterosaurs in a minute because I want to talk about the evolution of flight. But anyway, it's named for the Quetzal bird, and I thought that was kind of fun. And of course, in here in Berkeley, California, we have some really fabulous birds. Here's a uh, spotted choey that uh, we spotted up in the park, and we often see them. Uh, we uh, love these choeys, and um, they're a little hard to see. Uh, it's not like the choeys that are running around your backyard there, which are quite dull, but this is a, uh, a very colorful one. Uh, they scratch around in the underbrush, so in sort of shrubby areas, you're going to um, you're going to be able to see uh, spotted toeys. Um, so anyway, uh, going to the um, processes of evolution, how does evolution work? Um, sort of some points I want to touch on is natural selection, Darwin's idea, uh, seconded by Wallace. Both of them discovered it in the middle of the 19th century. And I'll talk a little bit more about how natural selection works. But I want to distinguish it from sexual selection. Um, I mentioned uh, the Quetzal male is very different from the female. And I'm sure you've seen that with lots of different birds that the males often are fancier looking. Uh, because the female will choose the mate and she'll choose uh, based on her criteria. And, you know, sometimes it's hard to fathom the mind of these females, but uh, we think that some of the things that they're after are um, good genes for their offspring. Uh, how um, successful is this male? Is he just some kind of scrawny male, or does he look like he's got good genes? Um, and then um, genetic combinations. What I'm referring to here is that... Um, Every individual in, in uh, sexually reproduced organisms. So, you know, some organisms sort of bud off in their exact copies, but uh, much more successful is when animals have male and female and then they uh, combine, then the offspring has some of the male and some of the female. Uh, so that produces new combinations of genes. And that's the kind of the raw material for uh, natural selection to work with. Um, so we need to talk a little bit about that. Um, and then uh, adapting to environmental niches. And I think the really important thing to point out here is that the niches don't stay the same. Cl climate changes, uh, rivers wear down mountains, uh, forests grow up, new species. So it's a, it's a uh, moving target in terms of trying to uh, adapt to, to niches. But anyway, a little bit about how evolution works that we're gonna see the um, results. So natural selection, um, the basic points here are is that every species produces extra offspring. So we see 
the birds, you know, they try and try and try and they have babies and they raise the babies, but a lot of them get eaten by snakes or by other birds or the nest falls down or, you know, shit happens. Uh, so in order to keep your population up, you have to have extra and lots of animals have a lot of extra humans, not so much, but, uh, that's, that's a, we do, uh, obviously over, overpopulate, um, variation. So uh, individuals are different from each other. So natural selection wouldn't have anything to choose from if there wasn't any difference. So if we were all exactly the same, how could you have, uh, uh selection? Now, where the variation comes from, this was a, a big problem for Darwin and for, you know, right up through the 19th century. And in the 20th century, people started to uh, pick up on genetics. Uh, Mendel was actually earlier, but nobody knew what he's doing there. He was kind of off by himself. But in the 20th century, uh, genetics has become um, very important for understanding how the variation happens. Uh, and then differential success. Some individuals have more offspring. Uh, so that's where the direction evolution is going to go in that as uh, who, who is successful. Um, and then the evolution of the species will be more like the successful individuals. So it really isn't that complicated. Um, and one of the, I don't remember if it was Huxley or one of Darwin's pals, uh, when he heard uh, the theory of natural selection, that Darwin finally came out with it. He said, how incredibly stupid of me not to have thought of that myself, uh, because it's kind of obvious. You know, once you see it, of course, if you're hung up on uh, God doing everything, then I guess it doesn't seem that obvious, but if you're not. Uh, so natural selection, uh, pretty important. And I just wanted to uh, highlight one species here, a bird, uh, painted stork in uh, Sri Lanka. This is uh, one of our birds that we saw this year. Um, this is a large wader of the Indian subcontinent in Southeast Asia. They forage in flocks, and we saw really large flocks of them. Um, and they have this killer beak, uh, which they swish back and forth looking for frogs and fish and various uh, critters that they find in the water. And they uh, stir the water with their feet to kind of stir up the prey. So I'm just gonna show you a little video um, of how this guy uh, operates. So keep an eye on his right leg. See how he's wiggling his right leg there? So that's what he does is he stirs it up to get the critters to try to run away and then he nails them with the bill. Now, you know, that's a pretty cool trick. But my point is, it's behavior that's shaped by evolution. The birds that could do that had an advantage over the ones that couldn't. So behavior itself is subject to selection. So that's natural selection in operation. It's, it's an area of uh, genetics that is not well under, understood, that there isn't really a, a good um, way of, you know, can't point to the gene for wiggling your foot, you know. So uh, there's a lot of things that, that genetics hasn't figured out yet. So that's something for the future. Um, another one of our wonderful birds from uh, Sri Lanka, a migratory bird, uh, the blue-tailed bee eater. What I find fascinating about bee eaters is that they're colonial. They, they nest in big colonies. And uh, these guys um, dig holes in sandy banks. So on the bank of a stream or by a road cut or something, you'll find holes and the bee eaters will be all, uh, and of course it's helpful because they have a, a built-in alarm system. Anybody sees a, a raptor, they, they let everybody know and they'll take cover. Uh, but the downside is, is there enough food around for this large number? So um, anyway, natural selection, you know, you have to weigh these pros and cons, uh, what works in what situation. Um, now sexual selection, uh, the male, there's sort of two main types. Males compete for females. So we're all familiar with rams butting their heads or uh, male lions fighting to, you know, take over the pride or that's very, very common that the, the dominant male will take over the, the group or the female and um, will want to mate the female so his genes get passed on. So that's a very uh, common 
thing, and it varies from one species to another. There's a lot of different ins and outs about that. But the other one, which uh, Darwin had a hard time convincing his um, his uh, people back in the 19th century, is females will choose mates with desirable traits. And the, the, in the 19th century, they said, well, wait a minute, females choosing? No, it's the males that do the choosing. We all know that. You know, the females just sit there and try to attract, and then the male comes along, and hopefully she can attract a, but uh, Darwin says, well, actually, you know, if you look out in nature, uh, there's a lot of uh, males doing sort of dopey things, and the only reason they're doing it is because the uh, female will be attracted. Uh, but, you know, I'll show you an example in a minute, but um, obviously the more successful matings produce more offspring, and and both of them want to have offspring that are going to be successful. So my point is that sexual selection is different from natural selection. And here's the sort of prime example. Um, this is the uh, Sri Lankan version of the Indian peacock. And you can see this incredibly long, beautiful tail. What's the point of that? You know, it's, it, it's a handicap. It, 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 weighs him down. You can't fly as fast. You can't get away as fast. And the way um, evolutionary uh, theorists like to think about it is that it's something called the handicap principle. And the idea here is that if he's strong enough and good enough genes to get away with carrying around this ridiculous appendage, he must have really good genes. So that's a way of uh, advertising how fit he is. He's really, really fit. Now, does the female think about it that way? Well, probably not, but we don't know what they think. Well, all we see is the results. But anyway, we uh, were fortunate to uh, see the uh, peacocks there. And uh, here you see the, the male peacock with a stork. Now, I don't think that he's coming onto the stork, although I could be wrong about that. Um, but um, I want to just uh, show you a little bit of video here. So it gives him the full frontal display there. Um, so anyway, is it was a kind of a fun thing to see in action. In this case, clearly it's more territorial. I don't think he's attracted to the stork. At least you know we don't like to think that. Uh, but um, so it's territorial. But you know he also uses this as a way to attract a female. So. Uh, Let's see, uh, last little thing about, about evolution, the genetic basis of variation. So, you know, the genes are codes for proteins. So the, the, the structure of your body is coded for in your genes. So you inherit your genes from your parents, your body uh, reads those genes and builds these, uh, the structure. Um, and those are kind of the basic, you know, uh, first level genes that people have figured out. So genes code for proteins, proteins make up your body's structures. The regulatory genes are very, very important. And I think in evolution, they take the, uh, a really big role because there are these regulatory genes decide how much and when these protein, proteins should be produced. So they're like dimmer switches. They're like on-offs, or maybe a little bit more, or maybe a little bit earlier. So you can have the same set of structures, and just by turning it on and off earlier or later or longer, you can get bigger, you can get smaller, you can get all these, all this variation can be um, uh, produced based on the same set of structural genes. And we think this is probably one of the most important uh, ways that evolution works, because the third point here is that evolution is mostly tinkering. It's basically working with what you've got. 
You know, it's not like evolution says, oh, well, let's see, let's create something that'll fly. No, it works with something that's around and modifies it a little bit and uh, with, with random mutations. Uh, it conducts experiments. So uh, these random mutations are experiments with getting smaller, getting larger. And of course, with the dinosaurs, being larger is a really big item. But you, as we'll see, being smaller might work better in some situations or working more quickly or more slowly maturing. Because one of the ideas about the evolution of birds from, from dinosaurs is this idea called pedamorphosis. Now, what that means, you might recognize that pedo means child, as in pediatric. Morphosis is just form spelled backwards. So it's just uh, the, how the, the child form maybe takes precedent over the adult form, meaning that uh, slow down the maturation process. Have the adult be more like a child. And we think that this is also a very, very interesting way of understanding the evolution of birds and also the evolution of humans, which uh, I wanted just to show you some pictures here uh, of when you look at a baby ape, now this is a chimpanzee over here on the right, and over here we've got a baby orangutan, and their, their features are much less pronounced than in the adult. They, the brow ridges are not so uh, strong. The face is not protruding as far. Uh, so it, you can see that the, the, the human is more like an infantile or juvenile ape. And that's one of the ways it it's, doesn't get you the whole story, but it gets you uh, some explanatory power. And on the bottom, we've got a sapien skull with a juvenile chimpanzee skull. And again, you see the brow ridge is really not that pronounced and, and the face doesn't stick forward as much still doesn't have as high of a forehead. That's what we, of course, we look for in, uh, in human, humans and their ancestors. But just to give you a little bit about this idea of pedamorphosis. And with the birds, uh, you know, they talk about the incredible shrinking bird. If you're gonna fly, you need to get small. So most of the period of the Mesozoic, when the dinosaurs were getting bigger and not competing each other, uh, bigger, 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 bigger. So you got these gigantic things, you wonder how the heck did that ever work? Um, but some animals took the other route and they found a little niche somewhere. And of course, with the extinction event uh, at the end of the Mesozoic, when the meteor hit the earth, uh, the small ones had the advantage and the big ones died out. So uh, they got theirs in the end, but uh, the birds had to kind of wait their turn. So. Here you see paravis. These are uh, aves, of course, are birds, and paravis means sort of getting there, or pre-birds. And so these are dinosaurs that could evolve into birds. And they're, they're showing him uh, here during the, uh, the Cretaceous period at the end of, uh, of the Mesozoic. So I've been talking about some of these eras, and I just wanted to give you a little uh, summary here. So the, you read this chart sort of from the bottom to the top because when people dig, the older is lower, right? So uh, so the older is down here at the bottom and the Cambrian is kind of the beginning of uh, multi-celled animals. So this period of the Paleozoic goes on for a very long time, 570 to 245 million years ago. So uh, how much is that? 300 and some million years. Um, and the Mesozoic, this is the age of the dinosaurs, and it has three uh, periods, Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. And here at 66.4 million years ago, uh, this is when the meteor struck and knocked out the dinosaurs. And so the, uh, again, the life had to kind of re-evolve, you know, probably as it's going to have to re-evolve after uh, we get through screwing things up. But uh, one of the other things, uh, just mention here, at the end of the Permian, so at the end of the Paleozoic, uh, there was a big extinction event also. And so the Mesozoic is this really interesting era that started from not scratch, but very, very low, maybe five or 10% of the life forms that survived that one. And then it evolved to have this amazing, you know, let's try big 
Uh, and then at the end of that, uh, they got knocked out with this uh, meteor, and so now we're trying something else. Um, so just to illustrate this, I wanted to um, get back to flight because that's one, one of the things we're really interested in here. Um, so we have different flying animals. Uh, the insects in Venom flight way before anybody else. And so during the Paleozoic, back to uh, then the Carboniferous, we find um, fossils of insects. Uh, the pterosaurs, uh, during the, they started out in the uh, Jurassic and Cretaceous uh, in the Mesozoic era. And then the flying dinosaurs in the later Mesozoic, uh, and then birds continuing on. And then, of course, mammals uh, evolved flight in the, in the recent the Cenozoic, so that would be bats and other flying animals. So just a couple of uh, insects uh, to uh, take a look at. Uh, the dragonfly, very, very ancient. Uh, this, this, not this one, but uh, here's one from the Jurassic, uh, 120 some million years ago, uh, found from these wonderful limestone deposits in, in uh, Germany. And then a bat, so this is a fruit bat from Sri Lanka. Um, it's relatively small as fruit bats go. I think it was only about, the body was probably about nine or 10 inches long. They get up to a foot and a half long. And they call them uh, flying foxes sometimes because they have this kind of cute face. Uh, they're a lot cuter than other bats. Um, but anyway, I had, to, I had to look up bats because you know I think they're fascinating animals. Um, there's 180 species of fruit bats and there's about a thousand total species of bats. And all the bat species together comprise 25% of all mammals. Now you combine that with the rodents. Now the rodents are about 50%. So 75% of all mammal species are either bats or rodents. So uh, that kind of puts us in our place. But anyway, they invented flight and they're very interesting. We could maybe talk about that some other time. But here's the, um, the pterosaurs. The pterodactyl is the most uh, well-known one, um, but there's many other uh, types of uh, pterosaurs. Uh, really a lot of fun. This is the Quetzalcoatlus, the one that I talked about earlier, uh, that has this huge wingspan. Um, see if I give you a couple of uh, statistics about the Quetzalcoatlus. Well, here somewhere. Anyway, very long wingspan, and um, but they had um, a wingspan to nine meters, about thirty feet. Um, that's pretty big, and uh, one of the things is that they have hollow bones, and and this family of dinosaurs called theropod dinosaurs. One of the things that they had was hollow bones. Hollow bones, of course, allow allow you to. Be, if it's constructed well, strong, but lightweight. So, you know, they had to try to uh, keep their weight down. Um, but here's the pterosaur distribution. I mean, these things are all over the darn place. Um, very, very successful type of um, animals during the Mesozoic, not a dinosaur. You know, there's, there's pterosaurs and ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs. These are all different kinds of reptiles during the uh, Mesozoic. Dinosaurs were just one group. So, okay, now we're getting to uh, the theropods. This is a type of, of um, dinosaur. So here you see the theropods down here at the bottom and birds branching off from them uh, during the Cretaceous. So towards the end of the um, Mesozoic, the birds are branching off. But you see they are one branch, you know, they're in this one branch called Saurischians. And there's another whole branch up here. You got Stegosaurus and all this and that. But uh, our very favorite T-Rex is here in the theropods. So uh, he does belong on that title slide with, you know, uh, how do you get from T-Rex to Tweety? Well, uh, he does have some things in common. Uh, and the thing that I would point to first would be bipedalism. He's on two feet. Uh, so birds became, and, and uh, theropod dinosaurs became uh, two-legged way before uh, our ancestors thought of it. Um, here's just a few other uh, examples of, of um, 
these dinosaurs, flying dinosaurs, um, Anchiornis, Huxley eye, uh, around 160 million years ago. This is one's from China, uh, the size of a crow, it had feathers all over and um, also scales. And uh, here's another one, um, Microraptor, also from China, a little bit later. And he had these uh, feathers, very much like bird feathers, they call them pinaceous feathers on his arms, tail, and legs. And so some people call him the four-winged dinosaur. And there's a lot of debate about what was, did he use those feathers? Did they fly with two sets of wings, so to speak? Or that's kind of up in the air, we're not too sure. Uh, and here's a, this one I find really bizarre, Lumosaurus, Western China. Again, we've gotten huge amounts, particularly since the 1990s from China. Um, he's about five and a half feet long, so not huge. But what I found interesting is he, the adult doesn't have teeth. The juvenile does. So this isn't pedamorphosis, this is something else. Uh, he uh, develops this uh, uh, beak, sort of. So a beak is kind of an alternative to uh, having teeth. And the interesting thing about birds, of course, it's more lightweight, so that helps. Now, Archaeopteryx, probably if, any, if, if you know anything about this field, you've heard of Archaeopteryx, and Archaeopteryx has been around, uh, been known about for uh, decades. I think, it, I think it was back to the 70s or something. It was found in uh, southern Germany. There's this wonderful limestone deposit there in, in Bavaria. Um, so uh, it's a, it's a bird-like dinosaur. And uh, these are some examples of the fossils that are found in this limestone. And the limestone is really famous because of good quality preservation. And so they're able to find features of the uh, Archaeopteryx, including feathers, um, claws, um, they even found what they call melanosomes, which are uh, color bodies. And um, they can't tell exactly what color, but they think it was probably black because there's something about the black pigment that confers uh, strength to a feather. So I don't know, that's a lot of these things, you know, you have to say, well, are they really sure? Well, they think so, and, you know, so it's, a, it's kind of a mystery thing. Uh, but he's the size of a, a raven, about a hundred, uh, one and a half feet long. Um, the feathers, uh, here's a reconstruction of uh, what we think that he looked like. We think he flew. Um, I want you to notice that he has these little claws up here on the edge of his uh, wing. I can see it here as well. Here's two, another one here. Uh, very interesting feature. Um, so uh, feathers, you know, they have a lot of functions. They're, they're also good for warmth. Anybody who's uh, camped out with a down sleeping bag knows how nice uh, feathers are for warmth. So that I believe could well be understood as an adaptation when they're becoming warm blooded because you know, warm blooded animals have to maintain their body temperature. So it's more important and uh, feathers are one way, fur is another. Um, but they're also good for flying, so maybe that permitted the evolution of flight. Um, so here's just a drawing of a sort of a um, Archaeopteryx and showing some of the bird features and um, reptile features. It's got teeth. So you see it's got teeth, boom, it's not a bird. But it has a lot of other features. It's got this wing claw. Most birds don't have that but it has what they call an airfoil wing. So it is a good uh, characteristic for flight. So we think that Archaeopteryx, people don't want to call it a bird, but they say that it's a bird-like dinosaur and perhaps a um, transitional, you know, maybe it's on, of course, it's sort of funny to call something transitional because if you asked him, he says, I'm not transitional, I'm what I am. You know, I, every, every stage has to work. You know, it's not like they're uh, planning to be something else, you know, a few million years later. But in retrospect, we might call it transitional. 
Uh, here's a comparison of an Archaeopteryx and a chicken skull. Uh, so you can see this beak is plenty lethal. You know, beaks are hard and you, you, uh, birds get a lot out of their beaks. And here's a, another uh, beak. Now this is from an ibis, which is a big uh, wading bird. Do we have them up here in California in the wintertime? Um, so the beak has, you know, once you've got beaks, well, then you can evolve into all kinds of different beaks. And that's one of the things, if you're a bird watcher, you watch for the beak because the beak will tell you something about what the bird is eating, how it's, what its adaptation is. And so that's a, a helpful feature. So here we are at the end of the Mesozoic and there's the meteor about to strike the earth and all these uh, reptiles uh, flying around and zooming around and uh, about to, uh, get toast, toasted, and uh, big change. And so now we're gonna move into birds. And um, here's a, uh, an early bird, this is called Paracoraceus. And um, again, that para means on the way to or pre or something, and the coraceus are the rollers. And I, I showed you a picture of a roller before, this one, the lilac breasted roller, everybody's favorite from Africa. And here's an Indian roller, which we saw in, uh, Sri Lanka this year, also a very beautiful bird. I think there's about 18 different rollers. Uh, I, don't, I think we've only seen three. I think there's a European one we saw, but um, that gives us something to aim for. Um, now I wanna get into this uh, wonder chicken. Uh, wonder chicken, uh, I find extremely fascinating because um, this, its real name is Asteriornis. Um, and it lived um, 66.7 million years ago. Now that's a little bit, that's 0.4 million before the impact of the asteroid. So it's uh, right there, you know, and it did, uh, it did survive. It combines uh, chicken and duck features. So the suggestion is that the original bird started to come out of this catastrophe had the reason that it was successful seems to be that it's sort of non-specialized. It goes around and, and it can eat everything. Uh, it's probably a shorebird that we think because of the long legs, uh, but it's relatively small, uh, has a generalized diet, eats a lot of different things, it's terrestrial. And apparently those traits allowed it to survive the uh, impact of the asteroid and to go on and kind of be the one or among the early birds that, uh, that, that evolved. And then they evolved into a lot of different things. So here's another, here's a modern shorebird, uh, the red wattled lapwing. And there's just a ton of these. You go down to the bay and take a look and in the wintertime you see more, but um, a wonderful set of birds. Um, and here's a swamp hen, which I think the beak looks a little bit more like uh, that wonder chicken. Um, and then here's a chicken. Now, um, I've always found it fascinating to try to find the animals that gave rise to our domesticated species. And this is, this is an example. This is the one from Sri Lanka. Uh, but it's very similar to the one from India, which was domesticated a long time ago to uh, provide uh, chickens. And of course, if you were to say, what's the most successful bird in the world today, you'd have to say the chicken because um, there's millions and millions and millions of them and uh, they seem to keep going. So um, anyway, here's a, a little video uh, I wanted to show you of, the, of this. Uh, Chicken. Well, this one was kind of tame because you notice he's got a bad leg. His right leg is not working well. And so he's gotten a specialty in uh, uh, getting food from the birders. So there's this trail in Sri Lanka that all birders have to go to. And, um, you know, he's there and, hey, you guys want to see the original chicken? Here I am, you know. But he's an incredibly beautiful bird, you know. Uh, and he, people say, ah, it's just a chicken. Well, you know, it's the original chicken. Um, now another bird that, uh, this is a bird in um, 
South America in the uh, basins of the Orinoco and the Amazon rivers. This is a very goofy bird, uh, the Watson. He's loud, They're, they flop around, you know, they're not very good flyers, they squawk a lot. You know, they're uh, quite conspicuous. If you're, in, if, you're, if you're near them, you're gonna know they're there. They're pretty amazing birds. Here's the distribution in South America. And um, here's the chick. Now notice that the chick has these little claws at the bend of the wing. So um, this does not persist into the adult, but it makes people feel, and they, they, they have um, researched this and looked into the genes and so on, and they think that the, um, its ancestry goes way back, and uh, it's tempting to, to, to see it as uh, descended from uh, Archaeopteryx, certainly not directly, but a lot of those avian dinosaurs had these uh, wing claws. People think that the reason that it persisted in this particular species is that's an extremely uh, wet habitat. If you're in the Amazon, okay, you're in the, in the trees, you know, that's pretty good. You know, there are predators, but it's not so bad, but don't fall in the water. You know, like you fall in the water and you're uh, toast. So we're gonna finish up here in a few minutes. Yeah, okay. So anyway, that's so here's comparison the Archaeopteryx and the and the Watson. So yeah, hey, uh, just right on time. Summary of the main points: uh, big extinction events permit big changes in life forms. Really interesting phenomenon. So the Mesozoic, you get these dinosaurs, they die out, and uh, the basis of new forms exists in their ancestors. Nature tinkers. In other words. Stuff doesn't just happen, it happens because there were predecessors that had some of these traits. The regulatory genes permit rapid changes without having to create new structures. So you can get bigger, you can get smaller, and you can actually, the beak from the tooth jaw, actually they've figured out, uh, it's one set of genes that if you give a little bit of change there, you get a beak. Uh, big worked for dinosaurs, small works for birds. So it's not like there's just one thing that works. Um, delayed maturation or pedamorphosis can help explain how dinosaurs became birds and how apes morphed into humans. Uh, we talked about pedamorphosis. And finally, birds are worth studying for their beauty and fascinating behaviors and for what they teach us about evolution. So um, let's hear it for birds. So that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. That was wonderful. I'm now going to see if there are any questions or comments from the rest of the people here. So if you can raise your hand um, by hitting the raise hand button, which I think is down, um, down on the bottom of your screen, then uh, you can ask questions or comment or whatever. I will unmute you as the time comes. Okay, Ken's got one. Oh, very nice, Roger, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> a little bit more about the transition, uh, the, 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 the pretty big change from the kind of skin dinosaurs have and mm -hmm. feathers. I mean, what, what's going on there? That's, a, that's really, a big, there's hollow bones in the dinosaurs, but did they have, did the precursors have feathers? Yes, um, many of the, Dinosaurs. Audrey, can you close that door, please? Yeah, sorry. Many of the dinosaurs have been found uh, with feathers, and particularly in China is where a lot of this uh, research has gone on, and they've been able to, to see that feathers did start with these um, theropods or these uh, sort of pre avian dinosaurs. Um, exactly how the feathers arose, I, there are and it's tempting to point to the pterosaurs because the pterosaurs, they weren't dinosaurs, but they did have this sort of fuzz. And so I think the uh, easy answer is that we don't have enough information really to trace all that, how it developed. But people get into the different types of feathers. There's little feathers that are kind of like down, and then there's what they call pinaceous feathers and so on like that. But yeah, dinosaurs uh, uh, did develop feathers. And you know, nowadays when they reconstruct dinosaurs, um, 
they color them different colors and you know we don't always know what color but uh, uh hey go for it <laughs> well, just one more question the, what, what what about the four legs of the dinosaurs do, do they go into wings and because it seems like placed in different places well they are sure i mean the the wing is an analog to the forearm and um yeah so the the theropods it is interesting they they're already uh two-legged and so the, the the arms are there practically vestigial in some species and so there's an opportunity and um so yeah they they evolved to um not necessarily have flight right away but to uh to have other functions and i think uh i mentioned about the feathers that they're keeping warm is a is a big item so i have a question from charlie and i just am unmuting him i think i'm trying to unmute him Oh, oh, oh. I'm muted now. Now you're unmuted. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Roger, I have a carry-on question about feathers. Mm. And I, it's a similar to a question I've had about fur all my life. Mm. As humans, we know about feathers and fur from dead critters. Yeah. And it's just sort of passive stuff that really insulates. Mm -hmm. But when it's on a living animal, I suspect that they can do things with feathers that make a big difference in how well they radiate heat versus holding it in and so forth. Can you elaborate on that? Well, I know a little bit about it. Um, the, one of the things about uh, these pinaceous feathers is that they have uh, little hooks that interlink. So it isn't just that there's this feather and that feather, but they're tied together. They have a, they function together. And then there's different um, uh, types of feathers. You know, there's there's a wing feathers and tail feathers and small fluffy feathers down, so on and so forth. So feathers have become uh, more specialized for uh, different parts of the body or different functions. For the most part, feathers are not sensitive. So um, the animals that um, there are these little down-like structures that birds have that are sensitive. So um, if, you know, if you ruffle the feathers of a bird, uh, the feather itself doesn't send uh, a message, but the base of it may rub up against these little downy structures. So they get some information back that way. So, um, and then, you know, if you watch birds much, you see they spend an incredible amount of time preening and, you know, they, they uh, try to keep their feathers in good shape and and there's a whole subject about molting, you know, how, how they lose their feathers. And different birds have different strategies. Some birds molt continuously, but only one feather at a time. In other words, other birds take off a season and then they just molt and they're, they're kind of like sitting ducks <laughs> while, while, while they're waiting for the new feathers to grow. Uh, so there's a lot about feathers and how feathers work. But those are just a couple of things that I know off the top of my head. Interesting. Thank you. Mm. Are there any other any other questions or comments that people want to make? I see. Yeah. Okay. I see. Irene. I just add, I just raised my hand. Who's that? Irene. Irene. Oh, hi, Irene. Uh, let's see if I can get you unmuted. I, well, you are unmuted, so go ahead. <laughs> oh yeah, I did it to raise my hand. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, I, it's not, I, 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 I don't know how to phrase the question. It's not kind of a question. But when you talk about metamorphosis, mm -hmm. what's the meaning of that? Uh, is there some, something that, um, be, I, I don't know quite how to say it, but the fact that a baby child looks more like a baby chip than a, an adult looks like the adult. What's, what, what meaning do we make out of that? Well, the idea there is that the adult human... Just turn off this uh, thing that's on Zoom. It's almost done. Just okay. The, the, the idea of it, uh, Irene, is that the, uh, the adult human is a childish ape. So, the, which, in other words, to get from, a, from an ape to a human, what you do is you delay the maturation of the ape. 
And so we have more fine features. We don't have the heavy brow ridges, for example. Um, another, another one that's maybe uh, more uh, obvious is the thing about the um, puppies, you know, and uh, domesticated, particularly dogs, I think are the best example, where dogs are like baby wolves. They're mm -hmm. playful, you know, they wag their tails. They're, you know, like if you, if you, if you observe wolves, you can see the dog and the, and the, and the baby wolf, you know, that's what, and so, so the pedamorphosis, the idea there is that uh, just by tweaking some uh, regulatory genes, you can get something new that's more like the baby of the ancestor. And so it points to the ancestry. Yeah, it points to the ancestry, and um, and in the case of the birds, they, they they there was this one guy who did research with uh, alligators, which I thought, well, alligators, but actually, birds are not too far distant from alligators. And sorry, Raj, um, I have to unmute you. Okay, now you're okay. Go ahead. Okay, I was just saying about the alligators. The guy worked with. Uh, with uh, fetal and uh, um, baby alligators, and he found similarities in structure between the baby alligators and the birds. So that was a clue that you know maybe you get to birds by petamorphosis. Small size, of course, is a, is a, another obvious thing. Any other questions or comments? You got some hands up. I think Roger, uh, Lauren, okay, Lauren, let me unmute you. <laughs> okay, unmuting you. Hi, Grandma. Hi, Daniela. <laughs> Hi, Daniela. Hi, Hi guys. Hi. Thanks for hosting this wonderful talk. It's <laughs> Thank you. I have to pay attention to one or the other right now. <laughs> um, so first, thank, thank you for hosting the call and inviting us. It's been very interesting and, and fun to listen to. Um, I had two questions. The first one is building on the pedamorphosis. And I'm curious if that relates to, you know, in humans, one of the traits that gets described is that it takes us a long time to mature and that affects the social dynamics and how we learn and are raised in families and all of that and if, if that's related or if that's a separate phenomenon oh i think it's very much related and i think um the the, the long maturation of humans people point to the ability to learn more in other words, we don't have to be functional right out of the box. You know, we, we have this long, long period. It's a very luxurious thing in our species. And, um, you know, some animals, uh, the babies are functional almost from the get-go. Uh, other animals take longer to mature. And humans probably take the longest of any animal because they need all that uh, parental care, guidance, and learning. So, again, uh, a trait of babies or juveniles is to be playful and play has a lot to do with sort of practicing behaviors and learning so i think the whole i think they're all uh, really uh, closely related part of the same bundle right great thank you so the second question i have is about uh teeth and beaks and if you could elaborate more on say the advantages of a beak or what the theory is on how they might have evolved. Yeah, so um, the beak, uh, they did uh, these uh, genetic experiments where they were able to um, change the development of uh, these uh, 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 alligators and get them to make beaks. And they did it by blocking uh, certain genes that would have led to uh, the tooth jaw. So it's, uh, it's in the development of the reptile jaw, at least in those kinds of reptiles, that this gene takes what's more primitive or more basic, I guess you could say, and then evolves it, take, develops it into a tooth jaw. But if you block those genes, you block the expression of those genes, you don't take them away, you don't have to genetically modify, but you have to block the expression, 
then the uh, it'll develop into a beak instead. And so what the beak does is it fuses it fuses the uh, bones of the lower jaw that, that they're what's called premaxillary bones fuse and become a beak. And the beak uh, can then, of course, develop into a lot of uh, different types. But uh, the the quote that I liked was they said that it's like having a pair of fingers on your face. And well, what I liked about that idea is that, um, you know, birds get a lot of mileage out of their beaks just the way we get a lot of mileage out of our hands. So the bipedalism in humans, one of the things they say, why did we become bipedal? Well, so that would free the hands. You know, the hands are now free. You can carry babies, you can carry food, you can bring food back to the nest, whatever. Uh, the birds, same thing. You know, so now you've got this, this uh, beak that they can use to carry twigs to make a nest or to go get food, bring it to the babies and so on and so forth. So uh, the beak is this uh, uh, very flexible structure and it's lightweight. So probably the lightweight piece is uh, important in, in its early development. Cool. So let's hey. see, I, uh, I can see that Charlie has his hand up silly you haven't asked a question. Are you still wanting to? Yeah, because you just talked about beaks and bills. And I have a question about when did the um, feature on some wading birds' bills uh, that have become so sensitized that they, they don't actually see their prey or whatever they're going to, they can actually sense um, some, they have a, an ability, a, a heightened ability. So they're poking their, their bills down into the mud, right? And they, right. They, they can sense the critter when it's down there. I'd have to look that one up. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know off the top of my head, but that's a fascinating uh, yeah. feature of some birds. So uh, Rhoda's, Rhoda's got her hand up. So you are now unmuted and go ahead. Oh, wait, 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 now I can hear you. Okay. So, of course, one of the marvelous teachers of birds is their song, and I've never heard the dinosaurs sing. And probably <laughs> <laughs> so I'm wondering at what point that happened, <laughs> the evolution of dinosaurs, of birds, I mean. Wow, I wish I knew the answer to that one. In fact, uh, I, I don't know if anybody thinks dinosaurs, I'm sure they made noise, you know. <laughs> It's, uh, you know, I, but uh, I, I, maybe somebody knows something about it, but I, sorry, I don't know the well, answer. Alligators croak. Yeah. Um, now we listen to, um, um, what, Madam, you okay? that, that movie and they were roaring and, you know, all kinds of noise. So they must've made noise. I think they did. Uh, we didn't have a, I, I think we just send Rhoda in the time capsule and send her back there with a tape recorder and she can record the, or her cell phone and she can record the, the sound. I see uh, Irene has her hand up. Irene, you want to ask a question, make a comment? You have to unmute her, I think. Oh, unmute. Okay, now you're unmuted. Are you there? Irene? Which Irene? Irene, you. <laughs> <laughs> I already did ask my question. Oh, okay. All right. So then, Charlie, you still got your hand up? Yeah, I've got, okay. another, I've got another question about evolution, Roger. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems like such a complicated process, but then they throw in millions and millions of years to try this one and that one, and mm -hmm. some of them work, so they persist. Mm -hmm. But with what you've just been telling us, it's like we not only have genes that will make certain things possible, we also have an awful lot of genes that can modify the action of those other genes. Right. Now, it seems right. to me that these modification genes, if you get them through, I don't know, radiation or whatever, they may not have a chance to get tested out in the environment to show whether they're better or not. Mm. But why do they persist? I mean, mm. why why do we have this extra special, special, extra flexible genetic programming 
when it's not being tested more immediately like we think ordinary mutations would be. I know, don't know if I'm expressing that well. well I, I, get your, I get your point. I, I do think that there's things that you can imagine. Something happened to the sound. Uh, Oh, 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 wait a minute. Something happened to the sound. Roger's image looks frozen, too. Uh -oh. Roger, do you have to reboot or something? Hold on. Roger, you may have to reboot because you're not coming through. I'm not coming. You don't hear me? Oh, well. Your video is not rocking, but your audio is distorted. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't. Oh, now, now there. he's back on. Now. Am I? Yeah. Okay. So, can you close that door, Audrey? Yeah. Um. So, uh, Charlie, I do think that that those genes are tested, and um, one of the interesting things that come about lately you know they they talk about how big the genome is and has always you know so many base pairs and all this stuff and it's quite variable and critters that you would think would would have a simpler genome might not and vice versa there's a lot that they you know, still trying to figure out of course but um if you can imagine an animal that didn't have the ability to let's say uh, change to get bigger, and then a, a mutation happened that allowed that. Well, the bigger one, it might be more successful or smaller or whatever feature. So um, I do think that they're subject to selection for sure. And um, uh, the, the thing is that there's this huge amount when came out with the uh, genome project, and they 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 uh, said there's so many genes and this and that. They had all this stuff in between the, the structural genes that they called junk DNA. And everybody said, no, we can't see that it's doing anything. It's just in there. Maybe it's just left over from before. Uh, and more, they're finding that there's, there's, uh, fun, it, it is functional. And a lot of them are, uh, is in this area of uh, regulatory genes. There's a lot of variation there. I mean, it isn't just bigger or smaller, or more or less. That's, those are they're simple. There's happening. Some of it has to do with uh, duplication of genes. They find multiple copies of the same gene and trying to figure out, well, what is that all about? You know, what 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 advantage is that giving? Are they producing more of the same proteins or you know, at different stages of life development? So, my opinion is that th that's a huge area, and when you look at the the, the vertebrates, I mean. Uh, the, the vertebrate pattern, which is covers all these different types of animals, it, it's pretty similar. You know, you look at the the fin, you know, the fin of a whale, and you look at the bones in the fin, and you can see, well, yeah, it's, it's a vertebrate. It's like a land animal, but it went to sea. And so all these little things, it doesn't take that much else using the same basic structure. So. I think the regulatory genes is a huge amount of uh, explanatory power there. And I do think that they are selected for. Uh, I don't see how you could uh, account for them otherwise. Um, see, I see that um, Ken has a question. Hold on, Ken. I'm going to. He's unmute. unmuted. Oh, he's got his hand up. He's unmuted. Yes. Uh, Go ahead, um, Ken. When I was growing up, I never heard dinosaurs and going into birds and then I woke up and all of a sudden it happened. What, what <laughs> happened? Why, why did we think this change? What kinds of new evidence were brought to bear? Because um, you, you sort of went through it, but what was it that convinced? Because, you know, just in the general culture, we never Yeah. Connection. Well, it's true. And I, I think it's maybe not obvious from the get-go. And I think one of the reasons is that the dinosaurs are known for being big, you know, birds are known for being small. So gosh, they're so different, but. So did, some, did somebody get a Nobel prize regular. for coming up with this or is it just some gradual realization? 
Well, they, they found the ar Archaeopteryx fossil. That was one thing. Okay. It had okay. feathers, and they were started to find feathers on That's other a, dinosaurs. A, a, I think Archaeopteryx is really the big turning point. Okay. I have to look it up. To f I think it was in the 70s that Archaeopteryx was discovered. Okay. And okay. they now have 11, 11 different uh, fossils of, of that Archaeopteryx. Whether oh. somebody won a prize for them, I don't know. All right, that's good. Thanks. That's good. Yeah. Well, okay. let's see. I don't see any more hands up. Okay. Anybody have a hand up? So uh, thank you all for listening. I'm going to unmute you all. Okay, here now. You can all clap. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Just yeah. brilliant. Thank you, Rod. Brilliant. Okay. Well, we'll right. tune in next time. Okay. <laughs> Ending okay. the meeting. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Bye. 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 Thanks Oops. so much. I that thought was I was awesome. leaving. <laughs> well, I ended the meeting, but. <laughs> Hi. 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 How are you? <laughs> Hi. <laughs> nice I'll... to see you. Hi, Amy. Hi, Hi Hello. <laughs> okay, so you're still here. Yeah, we can't click out. Okay. Uh, in 1954. Yeah, it goes way back. Take you care. Take it out. Huh? <laughs> hey, Ken. Hey, Monroe. Yes. Hi. How are you doing there? I'm fine. Good stuff. I like it. Good, good discussion. Oh, good. Good. I've only studied mammals archaeologically, and mammals from a paleontological uh -huh. sense. Uh -huh. It's fun. Well, that's good. Thank you. Hey, you guys, so, I'm going to out this new system here. Yeah. yeah. I hope you guys have been looking at the peregrine falcons on the top of the Campanile. Yes, thank you for reminding yeah. us. I looked, they're, I they're, have looked they're many really times. And they're cool and brutal. <laughs> they're fascinating. Yes. Yeah. Take care. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. I'll get out of here. I see Ken is still here. Um, oh, there we go. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Bye bye. Bye, everybody. You bye. Right. bye. bye. bye.